Um, it's been a long week. If you, uh, have you been here for other days uh, besides today? If you were here yesterday or a day before that or a day before that, please raise your hand. Right, if this is your first event in the Sabbath week, please raise your hand. Okay, so some people just came here for the ransomware event. If you are, so, sorry? Ah, specifically for me. <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you then. Um, if, you, uh, if you are a native English speaker, not a native, if you are not a Hebrew speaker, please raise your hand. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about ransomware. We're going to talk kind of fast, I'm sorry. Um, we don't have a lot of time and I have a lot of things to say. I hope I will not repeat some of the things that people before me said. Um, if I will, uh, just let me know that I can skip that because you already heard about that. My name is uh, My name is Meni Balzilai. I'm the CTO of the Cyber Research Center at uh, Tel Aviv University. Um, together with my uh, friends here, uh, Lee and Yuval, we also work with big companies around the world on their cybersecurity strategy. Um, I used to be the Chief Information Security Officer with the technological side of the intelligence uh, services in the Israeli Defense Forces, and I was um, worked for Bank of Olim for 10 years. Um, my last position there was the head of the IT audit department. That's that. I'm not going to say anything about myself. We're going to talk about ransomware. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them during the presentation. If there is something you want me to better explain, if there is something you want to add, whatever it is, please feel free to do that during the presentation. If you're ready, I'm going to start now. Yeah, you look ready. Perfect. When most people think about ransomware, they think about computer virus. What I want you to do, for the sake of this talk, I want you to free your mind. I want you to stop thinking about it as a computer virus and start thinking about ransomware as what it is. It is a business. It is actually a crime startup. A group of people with business goals and business plan. The business plan is illegal, but it is a business plan. And they work very hard in order to execute this plan. So we have this computer application, right? It is a product that was developed by a startup. And this product knows how to encrypt files in a very good way, not to harm the operating system, just to, to encrypt the, regular, the relevant files, uh, to maintain the keys in a different server somewhere. They have monetizing systems. You can pay them, right, payment mechanism. Um, they, in some of them, they have customer support. I'm sure you've heard about that, right? In some viruses, ransomware viruses, you have um, secure purchase. That means that if you pay the criminals, they sent you the key, and for some reason the key didn't open the files, they will give you your money back. So this is a business. If this business was legal, and those guys had business cards, it would be very easy for them to get, to get investment by investors. And it's important to remember that the crime industry or the crime ecosystem arrived at a very high and amazing maturity in the past five years. And we have an entire ecosystem. You have the people that develop the vulnerabilities. You have the people that develop the tools. You have the people that know how to do money laundering. You have everything there. It's much easier to be a criminal today than it used to be in the past because you have friends. You have an entire ecosystem. It's much easier to be an entrepreneur in Israel than, than it is in other places because in Israel we have an ecosystem for entrepreneurs. The same goes for criminals. Now this is a super effective business. It is a super effective business uh, that the police, uh, police uh, hates, specifically those police stations in the United States, all of which have paid criminals to open the files in the police station, which is amazing to me. Policemen that pay criminals to open files in the police station. This is, a super, this is a super effective way to make money today. Ransomware, it sounds like I'm, I'm promoting, like going into the business of ransomware, right? I'm not, I'm not. Obviously, we're the good guys. We're trying to fight that. But it is. Uh, we're opening the Israeli branch, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we want to present our new product. If you want to buy our ransomware, we're going to just sell it. You can take one on your way out. Um, so the FBI expect, um, um, sorry, the FBI says that in 2016, the payment for ransomware was $1 billion. There's no surprise that everybody wants one. Everybody wants to go into the business of ransomware. 
the crime industry is very excited about that. This is why we see more and more and more and more ransomware every year. And on the darknet, obviously, where you have marketplaces where you can buy and sell whatever you want in an anonymous way, there is an interesting saying. I say that all the, all the time when I talk about uh, the darknet. I will say it in Hebrew, and I will, I will translate it. I will try to translate it to English. In Hebrew, it would say something like, and in English it would, goes, it would go something like, only when a person puts a mask over his face, his true face is being revealed. The moment we've created a place where we can buy and sell whatever we want in an anonymous way, we created a place where the worst things that the human mind could create are there. Terrible, terrible things. Oh, yeah, it is a quote by, from which book? Because I looked, I looked for it, and I didn't find the origin. Yep, just send me the book, autographed by Oscar Wilde. I would be happy. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he didn't get, give me any credit. I would not give him. Um, Oscar Wilde, I will look for it, because I, I asked around, and I didn't find it. Thank you so much. Um, so the crime industry, everybody want to go into the world of, uh, into the business of cybercrime. Again, this is a business line, a very successful, a very high business line. So you can buy. Ransomware, as we know that packages of ransomware on the dark net, people say sell that uh, today. But we have to notice something very important. Um, and to us, to some extent, ransomware represent the problem in the cybersecurity industry. And it's a little embarrassing, and we're going to talk about this embarrassment. Ransomware right now is a sustainable business model. And when I say that, I mean that we can expect then in the years to come, it will continue to work, right? So what do I already know for a fact? I know, as much of you does, as much of you do, that we will see more and more and more ransomware in the years to come. We know that for a fact, right? We know that the problems are much bigger than people tell us. So some of our customers, they were hit by different kind of attacks. Most of those attacks are not disclosed to the public. So this is a bigger issue than what we think it is most of the time. And as I said, for us as cybersecurity professionals, this is embarrassing. This is embarrassing because with all the money we invest in cybersecurity, with all the amazing entrepreneurs, with all the amazing uh, startup companies we have, with all the amazing uh, uh, success that we present, with everything that we have, when people get hit by ransomware, what do we tell them? Pay. Seriously? That's the best answer that the cyber industry has to give to people who got hit with ransomware? Pay? This is embarrassing. We have so many amazing people, so many amazing technologies. Everything works fine. And our answer is, if you don't have backup, in most cases, not always, in most cases, you have to pay. So ransomware is a uh, 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 sustainable business model. And there are three reasons that led us to this point. Well, there are a lot of reasons that led us to this point. And I talked of some, on some of those in the past uh, a few days. If you were in the main plenary, you should know that the way the internet was designed, it was not designed with security in mind, but also only with connectivity in mind. And there are different problems that led us to this point. But I want to touch three problems. Problem number one, there's a very basic problem that we should all know about, attribution challenge. You're familiar with that, right? It's very hard to know who attacked us. We saw that that's in the presentation before me. This basic problem is also the reason that cyber warfare is such a successful thing right now. Every country attacks every country, but it's very easy. It's very easy to say it wasn't you. We know that. So most of us have been to the army, so we know that. If one country, wanted, let's say um, Indonesia, want to attack the United States, but the, the Indonesians don't want that the United States know that they, that they that that were there. So what would they do? They will take 10 people from Indonesia. They will send them to Russia by plane, right? Regular plane. They will fly. They will go to a computer store. They will buy Russian computers with cash money. They will go to a Russian hotel with cash money. They will compi uh, compile their code on Russian uh, computers with Russian software. Everything was bought by cash money. And then they will launch the attack from Russia, destroy all the computers, and go back home. It's very, very, very hard to prove that it wasn't Russia and it was the Indonesians. 
So the attribution challenge is a big deal. Even though it's a basic problem, it is an important problem. Problem number two, or, or issue number two. Ransomware is not a, a, a new thing. Most of us know that, right? Do you know from what, from what year is this ransomware? Because you heard that in the previous yeah. presentation? Okay, 1989. 1989. Right. So it's not a big, it's not, it's not a new thing. And in 2002, 2003, 2005, uh, we, were, we saw some of those. 2012, there was a peak in the amount of ransomware that we saw, and then a very, very big decline. Why? Why were there a big decline in ransomware that right now rose a again to a peak? Exactly. The, the, the reason that it rose again is Bitcoin. And the reason that it w there was a strong decline is that those people that had ransomware, and this is a very, very famous attack and very funny one for me, they had to ask for money using PayPal or something like that. And asking money from, uh, by uh, asking the, cre the, the victims to pay you via uh, PayPal is a very bad way to go about it. Why? Because it's very easy for PayPal to discover that this uh, wallet is uh, being used for crime, give the money back to the uh, victims, and find the people who want to use this money because there is a, a trace, there is a money trace. And then, uh, this, this is, a, if you don't know this one, are you familiar with this one? Well, this is, to some extent, this is a ransomware together with a fearware. So it says, like, um, we have identified, this is a fine given to you by the uh, Department of Justice, uh, FBI. You've got a fine. It's like if you park your car in the wrong place, you get a fine. This is exactly, they gave you this fine because you went into a website with, like a porno website, none of us do that, right? But those people did. Uh, you, you went to this child abuse website, you went to this spam website, whatever it is, they gave you a fine for it, and now you have to pay. And a lot of people believe that it was the FBI who gave them this virtual fine, and they actually paid it. Enter Bitcoin, obviously Bitcoin is the cash money of the internet. I'm simplifying it a little bit, and we could have had a very long talk about Bitcoin because I think this is a very important topic that every cybersecurity expert should be very well, uh, um, should understand it to a very, uh, uh, um, to the extent that it will help him to understand the trends that we see today in the world of cybercrime. But to, to, if I'm simplifying it a little bit, Bitcoin is the cash money of the internet. So with every movie that we see, the criminals ask for money, small bills unmarked in a suitcase, right? So this is, this is Bitcoin. This is exactly what we see in Bitcoin. And we know the trends were drive the, um, the uh, rate of Bitcoin up. And in some cases, if we have a big attack, people which are trying to buy a lot of Bitcoin take the rate up, and we see that all the time. So Bitcoin solved the biggest problem. That was the biggest problem the criminals had how to monetize crime. We just gave it to them. And now the world of cybercrime is so happy with the fact, not just, but not just the world of cybercrime, cyberterrorism, hacktivism, a lot of other things that sometimes need money in order to promote their agenda. Uh, Bitcoin solved the biggest problem that we had. Issue number three talks about trust, right? I'm sure people talked about that during one of the presentations before me. But the basis for this relationship between the criminal and the victim is trust, right? Trust is the foundation of love, but that's not related to anything. And when we, when we, talk, about, when we talk about trust, we know that if there will not be trust between the criminals and the victims, ransomware will stop, will cease to exist, right? Because people will not pay. Well, this is probably not represent the kind of trust we need. This, is, this represents the kind of trust we need. And, and, and in that sense, you know, You've just heard about the recent, right, the recent virus that we just had, the recent uh, ransomware, which is not exactly a ransomware. It's more of a wiper, right? If you pay, you don't get your files back oh, for different reasons. Those kind of attacks actually hinder the ransomware business. It is a business. It has customers, right? They have rep your reputation. The criminals have a lot of reputation. They have to maintain the reputation. They have to make sure that their customers, the victims, count on them and they can trust them because otherwise nobody will pay. The amount of people pay as a, as a function of the amount of trust there is in the world of ransomware. 
So where do we go from here? We're about to connect billions of new devices to the internet, right? We call that IoT, the Internet of Things, everybody is aware of that. And it seems like we, we're making things smart, right? Our shoes become smart shoes, the chairs become smart chairs, the tables become smart tables, um, our glasses become smart glasses, our bed becomes smart bed, everything becomes smart, and it seems like we have the ability to make a much smarter world, and instead we decide to do things like that, a smart device that will tell you if you need to buy more eggs, a smart hairbrush that will tell you if you brush your hair correctly. How hard can it be? A smart toothbrush that will tell you if you brush your teeth correctly. A smart condom that will tell you if you're, um, how bad you are with. Uh, and it seems, it seems like we're becoming, I'm not sure if we're becoming a more smart world. But what we already know that Internet of Things, those smart devices mean many new things to attack. Many new ways to attack them. And many new reasons to attack them. And the industry will fail in creating secure IoT devices. Why do we already know that? Because cybersecurity costs money, a lot of money. And those devices are aimed to be cheap. They don't have a lot of CPU. So, and cybersecurity requires a lot of CPU. They don't have a lot of disk space, and cybersecurity requires a lot of disk space. They are planned to not to take a lot of electricity to work on low power, and cybersecurity requires a lot of power. So they will not put cybersecurity. We made the entire cybersecurity industry not cost effective, and those devices are not going to be secure. We already know that. This is a fight that we already lost before it began. Cybersecurity is not cost effective. And when we're talking about IoT, we're talking about sensors. This is probably, in the world of cybersecurity, this is the most important word, right? All of those devices are going to bring a lot of new sensors to the world. And they're going to change. They're going to, it's going to be a small change in the way that those sensors work, because right now we already have sensors, right, in our phones. Right? We have sensors. But they're going to be a small change that's going to have dramatic effect. We are moving from a world where everything is always off, off by default, to everything is always on, on by default. That means that if I want to take a picture today, I have to take my phone out of my pocket, turn on the sensor called camera, click a button, and then I use it. But tomorrow, or starting today, if I want to stop taking a picture, stop uh, logging something, I need to do an action. And then changes everything. Obviously, it changes the world of privacy mining. Privacy mining is the business of the internet. I'm not saying that in a, in a negative way. It's just the way it is, right? Facebook and Google and Microsoft and other, well, maybe not Microsoft, but to some extent Microsoft, and other companies are big machines that knows how to transform privacy. You put privacy here, you get profit here, right? This is what they do. They transform privacy into profit, right? So this is, this is and so privacy mining is gonna be a big deal in the years to come. We're gonna have a lot of new ways to collect data about people. You're taking a picture? No? Yeah. I don't know, we're doing that or not? You're playing with me. <laughs> Okay, so this is a great example for, uh, um, for on by default, right, to the, and privacy mining. So uh, the police arrested this guy for killing his wife, and they discovered that he killed his wife uh, by using her Fitbit uh, a smart bracelet. Are you familiar with that? This is like a sport bracelet, counting like the amount of steps you're taking each day, and it was always on. This is on by default, right? If you want to stop logging your uh, whereabout and your uh, steps, you have to do something. Otherwise, it is on. It's on by default. And he said she was in one place, and they discovered she was in another place by using this all by default. In this case, to some extent, it actually was a positive thing. They succeeded in showing um, that he was the killer, but on by default we're go is going to violate our privacy uh, more and more. How is it re related to ransomware? Don't worry, we're getting there. So the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is not just one thing. It's actually a family of things, right? We talk about the Internet of Things, but actually we are talking about different aspects of Internet of Things. So we have smart houses, smart cities, wearable, driverless cars, heavy smart machinery, biotech, robots, and other things as well. Together they create the thing that we call the Internet of Things. Now we could have had a long discussion about each and every one of them. We're going to have a short discussion just about driverless cars. Um, I want to talk about ransomware and driverless uh, cars. Driverless cars are amazing. Obviously we know that we expect the world to be much safer with driverless cars and they, they're going to change the driverless cars are going to change humanity in so many ways that people don't even start to understand. 
Um, kids 10 years old might have a car, right? We know that. You begin your work day when you go inside a car. You sit inside a car, you open your computer, and you start working. That's it. There is no driving home, driving to. So many aspects are going to be revolutionized by driverless cars. And obviously, we expect them to be much safer. I want to show you a short video. I'm not sure if the sound works. Hopefully, it will work. Um, uh, and I ruined everything in my life. Never mind. Hold this. Ah, it's not going to work, right? Oh, it is going to work. So I want to show you a short video. Um, so we have here um, a device. I think it might be... Um, um, What's the name of the big company that does those smart devices in Israel? Uh, Mobili. I think it's Mobili, but it might be Tesla. I'm not sure. I, it is a Tesla car, but I'm not sure if they have Mobili or not. Um, so this device, uh, uh, you will hear the sound, beeping sound, the moment that this device says, you know what? I think something bad is going to happen. Let's start to stop the car. I want you to see how much time passes since the moment this, this beep goes off, saying, listen, something bad is going to happen, to the moment something bad is actually happening. No? We don't hear anything? I want, I want, to see, I want you to hear that. Again. Let's hope it will. So this car identifies that this car is not noticing the things that are going to happen. And those two cars have an accident while well, this computer understands I'm not going to be part of it, right? So driverless cars are amazing in so many ways, but we're going to see um, different scenarios with driverless cars, obviously. Um, scenario number one, for example, you're sleeping in the car. The GPS is set to take you home. Someone hacks your car and changes just one small thing, which is? The destination setting, the home address, the destination setting, right? You wake up, you look out the window, you feel like you've slept too long, you are in a dark place, you have no clue where you are, and from the other window you see two people that actually kidnapped you the same way they order pizza, right? It's a takeaway pizza, but just a takeaway kidnap. For uh, the sake of drama, and I wanted to emphasize the drama in this scenario, I uh, wanted to show you this slide. Did it create the, the, the effect? No? Yeah, it was a little stupid. Okay, scenario number two. Scenario number two, you're sitting in the car, you're watching TV, and here, we, here it is. You're watching TV. And suddenly, and even though you didn't touch it, the radio turns on. And then you hear this mechanical voice saying something like, Hello, dear sir. It is a nice day today, and we hope you are enjoying your ride. Please notice that we have taken full control over your car. Don't worry. We mean you no harm. You are kindly requested to wire transfer 12 bitcoins to our account in the next 10 minutes. Otherwise, we will sadly have to kill you. <laughs> and thank you for your cooperation. Now, you sit in a car. The car moves very fast. You might not even have a steering wheel. You know that in two minutes, you're going to reach a bridge. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a new type of ransomware, right? But instead of hijacking our files, they will hijack our assets. Assets hijacking. Ransomware for assets is going to be a big deal in the year to come. This is going to be a big issue, and we are not ready for it. And if you think that this is science fiction, it could never happen, just read about this incident, the Chrysler Jeep, right? Where two hackers proved that they can take control over this Jeep within a computer application. This can happen. So the first question people ask me, did it happen? We talk so much about hacking devices, right? Hacking cars, hacking pacemakers, hacking insulin pumps. This is such a sexy topic that we even have that in movies and in TV series. And people, uh, did you see that, Homeland? So in Homeland, which is based, if you're not from Israel, you might not know that, but it's based on an Israeli series. It was developed in Israel, and they bought it, and they take, took it uh, to the United States. So in this uh, TV series, we have a hacker hacking the vice president's pacemaker and killing him. By that, I just ruined the entire series. Don't watch it now. 
No, just kidding. This is a small part of it. Um, so we have that. And the question is, if this is so sexy, and everybody talked about that all the time, hacking the human body, hacking pacemakers, hacking insulin pump, well, did it really happen? Or is it just people trying to scare us? The real answer is, we don't know. But probably not. Why not? There is a basic rule in the world of cybersecurity. You know this rule. The attack probability is a function of incentive. That means that there is, there is, if there is a great incentive to attack you, the probability of you being hacked is higher. This is an obvious equation, right? And currently, there is no incentive to attack assets, no incentive to attack pacemakers, no incentive to attack insulin pumps, even though technically it is possible there's no incentive. If you want to kill someone, it's much easier to take a gun, even go on a plane, go there, take a gun and kill him is much easier than starting the research and how you can uh, hit an insulin pump and kill him. But the second question that people ask me, will it happen? Well, the answer to that question is 100% yes. People are already being killed by cyber attacks, but not directly. There are several cyber attacks that happened in the past years that, uh, that eventually led to the, the, the fact that people died. One example is um, um, Ashley Medicine, where people committed suicide because of the information that got leaked out of that uh, incident. Another example of that, when they took down the electricity in Ukraine, right, there are a lot of people that have uh, um, uh, devices that um, notify hospitals the, mo the moment something bad happened, the, the devices couldn't work, the electricity went down, and people die. The incentive will go up. Why, when, when will the incentive go up? When a lot of people will have driverless cars, obviously, right? When a lot of people will have um, 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 medical devices. We're going to a world, world where healthy people are going to have medical devices, right? This is the world we're going to. Um, but this is not the important issue that will lead to the fact that hackers will hack assets. This is the important issue. Standardization. Currently, we don't have standardization. And standardization takes the incentive up. Why? There are two things that lead to the, uh, that standardization creates. Number one, single point of failure. The moment you will have an ability with one hack to affect many cars, with one hack to affect many smart houses, with one hack to affect many pacemakers, then the incentive will go up. Um, and, and why? Because, as you remember, I told you at the beginning of this presentation, this is an ecosystem. This is not just one hacker decides to start a whole research on how you're going to hack one car in order to kill someone. That makes no sense. It is an ecosystem. The moment there is standardization, different people will start to play this game. So you will have a person developing the tool. You will have another person saying, oh, oh there is already a, a model. I can take this model and put it inside a bigger framework and then sell this framework to someone else. And then the moment this will be available, other people will start using that um, in order to do things. Only when we will have standardization in the world of IoT, we will start to see IoT hijacking and IoT uh, uh, ransomware. Yes, please. You are touching a brilliant point in that sense. And this is why um, um, sometimes I show the, the price to buy a username and a password for a bank account. I show that even if the bank account, the e-banking account, has uh, $100,000 in it, people will sell it for $2,000. And people ask me, why do they sell it? Why do, don't they just take the $1,000 from within the company, from within the, the bank? And the answer is that Different criminals have different moral standards and have different things that they are willing to do. There are hackers who say, I can, I can be, uh, steal uh, the username and password, but I'm not willing to use them. I can steal the username and password for your bank account, but I'm not willing to steal your money. You know why? Because it's dangerous. It requires a different set of skills. I'm willing to give you this username and password. You can use them. And you say, as a different criminal that knows how to do money laundering, you say, I don't know how to steal username and passwords, but I'm willing to buy them. This is how an ecosystem is being created. Ex that exact thing will happen in uh, IoT hacking. 
there are people who will be willing to kill other people in order to do extortion and ransomware, and there are people who will not be willing to do that. Those people will develop the tools, those people will use them. Um, the, the only, the only um, one thing that we might see, so in the past, I'm not sure if you know that, the, 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 if, you, if you spent more than 15 years in the world of cybersecurity, you might remember that we had something called fearware. Are you familiar with the concept of fearware? It's, it's an old concept, right? So we had, you worked on the internet and suddenly you had something like that, saying, um, I'm scanning your computers, or something like that, you know, warning 183 privacy violations found on your computer. You just worked on a website and you got this message, and this is amazing, 183 privacy violation, and you don't know why, because you, you, you work so well, you, you have antivirus, you do everything correct, you don't click on anything, and suddenly you have 183 privacy violation. Obviously, nobody knows what's privacy violation, but nobody cares. And you have a big button saying, remove now, right? And you click on remove now, and then you get this message. You know what? This application is just a scanner. If you want to buy the part that actually cleans your computer, it costs about $30. And people buy this antivirus. It will work on their computer. It will show them that it cleaned everything and everything well. Obviously, nothing technical just happened here. It's fearware. It uses, it's used fear in order to make you buy that. So what we might see, I don't know. We might see, and I'm not, I'm not giving ideas to anyone. Um, you know, a lot of hospitals were hacked in the past few years, right? A lot of uh, um, health-related da uh, databases were hacked. So someone might take this database, will call people saying, I know you have a pacemaker. I know that this is his model. I have total control over it. Either you will pay me $2,000 uh, in bitcoins, or I will kill you. Now, this person only knows how to make phone calls, right? But he will try to do fearware, right? He will try to use fear in order to make you pay. And in the example I already gave you, you sit in the car, the radio turns on, you might hear the sound from the, the, from the uh, radio, but the hackers don't have control over your car, and they just try to make you uh, to be afraid in order to make you pay. So I want to finish up just by saying that it's very important to work together. I said it all the time during this week. Trust is something that we can only create together. We have to work together you know, to make sure we're moving towards a safer future. Um, Cyber Week 2017 is almost up. We're the, the team of the ICRC and Professor Benny Sayalo sits here, leads this team, is already working on Cyber Week 2018. I think we should try to make sure that we're working together people from different countries. I want to show you a short video about, it's not related video, uh, it is a short video of um, someone asked a question, how can you get anywhere? And the answer was, maybe if you hold the letter, they will let you uh, uh, into everywhere. Are you familiar with this video? So the, the, name of, the title of this video is, you can get anywhere with a letter. Do you want to say something before I show this video? Because otherwise, I will finish my presentation. OK, so can you get anywhere with a letter? Let's see.
Okay, did you get the idea? Do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? We have about 30 seconds left, I think. Yeah, we have like 20 seconds. Left. Okay, guys, thank you so much. If you want to contact me, those are my details. Hope to see you again next year. Have a wonderful day ahead. Do you want to say something? Else? This is it. <laughs>